if most of your trauma has happened in a house, if most of your trauma has happened with your significant other or with your mother and father or with a certain sibling, and you're going right back to it, your tools that you've learned in three months or in a weekend, they're not strong enough, right? They're not secure. Like, and we could even take that scientific with the brain. They're not set enough to go back to that environment and be able to just completely thrive. That's why they say in recovery, it's people, places, and things. Like you have to change those three Mm. to support your recovery. Hello, and welcome to the Emotional Expedition Podcast. I'm Meg Thomas, and if you want to live a more open-hearted, magical life, it all starts with your emotions. This podcast will take you on a journey, helping you to better understand, express, release, and heal your emotions. Let's get exploring. Welcome back, everyone. I have a very special guest, which I always say all the guests are special, but I am so happy to introduce you to a new friend, somebody who I have deeply had an immediate connection with. The world kept telling us we needed to meet. And usually for me, it takes me hearing somebody's name three times or whatever the thing is, you know, hearing about breath work three times, whatever it is, I usually have to hear it three times before I actually take the action. This is one of those cases, Tracy Mergler. I'm so happy to have her here. She is, she's a connector. She's a creator. She's a believer. And she is changing the language around mental health by providing safety, connection, community, education, and empowerment. She's the founder and director of a nonprofit organization called Safe Space Organization. And it's a non-clinical community safe space that strives to change the conversation around mental health by educating, connecting, and supporting others through peer-to-peer network. Safe Space is a community hub with a therapeutic alternatives that empowers individuals to self-manage their mental health by accessing community resources, providing a space, and empowering the process of healing. Basically, she's created a space to help people be empowered in their own healing journey. It's so magical. I can't wait to hear more about it. Tracy has many different types of offerings. She offers support groups inside this nonprofit organization. She has all different types of support groups. Some of them are disordered eating, trauma, PTSD, caregiver support, men's groups, women's, women's postpartum support, and many more offerings to come. And she's also a coach. She's an incredible coach. For those individuals who've been diagnosed with an eating disorder or individuals who are struggling to find a healthy balance with food and exercise. So we welcome you, Tracy. How are you today? I'm so good. Thank you for having me. And what an introduction. I mean, come on. But I'm so glad mm, to be here. That's all you. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So how did we get here? (laughs) That's where, tell us the whole story. How did you get to somebody launching this incredible nonprofit organization? Because I know that very often our our journey is, is what leads us to these places, to the need to create something like this. So would you mind sharing your journey with us? Yeah, you know what's funny is as soon as you said that, how did you get here? The word that came to mind was shame right off the bat. And I think Mm -hmm. it's because there was this part of me that always shamed my story, shamed what I was going through, shame that I saw the world differently and couldn't make sense of it. There was so much shame with what I considered failing in a lot of ways, right? To get me to where I am. And now, and now that is, the word that I, I mean, I fight that daily. Let's be honest. Shame is something that I, I probably feel daily that I still have to counter, but now it's more about empowerment and strength and resilience and to see 
how far I have come. And so I, I appreciate you saying it like that because I just had my own like aha moment as I was Mm. here. But let's see, how did I get here? I would say I uh, was actually diagnosed, but struggled with an eating disorder that developed early on in my childhood. And I, I used food to cope, which so many Americans, so many people in our society do, you know, it's even a running joke, you know, after a breakup or after a seriously stressful time in your life, you use food, you use alcohol, you know, we make it sort of a thing here in our society. But I developed as a very young, empathic and feeler of a child that food kept me safe. And I learned that it helped me control my emotions. It helped me control my voice. It helped me control the environment I was in. And then around 14, when I hit puberty and my body changed, it then really turned into like a full-blown quote-unquote eating disorder. And I was in and out of treatment all of my life. And what I was told worked didn't really work. I mean, it was a piece of it, right? I, I was put on medication. I was put through, I was always in talk therapy and it just, it felt like I was always just surviving. And so I assumed something was wrong with me because I was like, this is what feels like surviving. And if this is all there is to life, then I don't know if I want this because every day was painful. Every morning getting out of bed and It felt like most days I was putting on an act. I was putting on a smile. I was living a life that I I couldn't make sense of. And so this last time around, uh, about six years ago, I went inpatient for nine months. And when you go for inpatient of an eating disorder, it's a step-down approach. And you go for a residential stay, and then you go into a PHP, which is like an all-day, but then you go home at night. And then you do an IOP, which is like a few days a week. And then you go to a regular therapist outpatient approach. And so I did the whole step down approach. And then I came back to Syracuse. What I missed the most were my people. And so one night I was sitting at the dining room table and being a special ed director and, or a special ed teacher and very visual, I got out my paper and my crayons and I just started to create this idea of safe space, because I missed treatment. I missed that safety and those people that surrounded me that made me feel like I wasn't alone in this battle. And so I was like, how do we create this at a community level? Because I know I'm not the only one that's struggling. And then COVID hit. And then I realized that this need was not just for individuals in the recovery world, that this need of connection and safety and vulnerability and empowerment and building a toolbox was something that everybody on this planet could benefit from. And so the idea started from there and it's kind of over the past three years kind of transformed into what safe space organization is today. Mm, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Now, why do you think recovery programs have failed? Why, why do you think it didn't work the first time for you? And I know many of the people that you work with and experience it. That's just a known statistic is whether it's for alcohol recovery, it just doesn't work the first time. And or why do you think that is? That's such a good question. Because they say that an individual has to go to eating disorder recovery five times, treatment five times for it to start to work. And so in one sense, I think the the United States, the States has taken on a very medical model in our treatment facilities, right? So we are very medicine based. That's the first thing you do when you walk into a treatment facility. You're, You're diagnosed and your meds are fixed and you're placed on typically more and I'm not med bashing, believe me, because I, I do think there are times and places. And But what I, I wasn't taught is that the goal is to get off of them if you can, right? It's to help you through that transition. It's to help you build these tools up that you can one day be off of them. And so when I was put on all these meds at 14, I didn't know that that was the goal. Mm. So what it did was it, it kept me numbed 
It didn't let me experience the lows, but it definitely didn't let me experience the highs of life either. And so I was just kind of numbed out. But with that, I couldn't access the pain that I needed to access in order to heal. And that is really going back through those scenarios that forced the eating disorder to develop in the first place and really processing and feeling them. And so our current mental model is very med-based and very talk therapy-based. And so what we don't do is give people, or what, not that we don't, not everybody, but we don't give those tools and that empowerment for individuals to do that all on their own. So instead, they're now reliant on medical professionals to do it for them instead of like healing the whole person, right? Empowering that mm. whole person. So in my belief, that's it. And it, I didn't find recovery until I found the more spiritual, the more soul, the more like holistic side recovery, which is not what we really teach here in the state. Yeah. Wow. I'm really resonating with with that in, in my own experience of being on um, Cymbalta. And it, it helped me. It helped me in a time when I really needed it. But I also got to a place where it was, I was getting so numbed out that I couldn't feel anything. No highs, no lows anymore. And isn't it scary to make the choice to want to feel again? And to feel because all of it comes with it, all of the unprocessed trauma, the sadness, the grief and the joy. Oh, my gosh. It is. It's terrifying. And I think that's why a lot of people have a hard time doing it. Even, you know, even if I'm, they're on a low dose antidepressant or something like that, that jump, because, you know, you're opening a vault. You're opening, and for me, it was 20 years of that, right? So it was a two-year process of there would be things that would come up some days that I'm like, where is this coming from? Where is this emotion? Like a situation would get, would trigger me, a memory would trigger me, and all of a sudden, I'd have this intense emotion. I've had this sadness. I've had this exhaustion, and and I had to get to a point to just be like, I, this is part of it. This is all part of it. It doesn't have a certain look. It doesn't have a certain rule book for us, right? But yeah, yeah, I had to get really comfortable with experiencing a lot of different emotions, right? You talk about that all the time and making them all okay. And I've learned something about myself that I am, I am a feeler, right? Like mo most of us are in this, in this area. Because of that, it's like my Achilles heel. Like it's this amazing trait we have, but it also, if we don't learn how to like roll with it, it, it will take us down, right? We have to carve out time for rest and relaxation and processing and art and creativity and nurture. And we have to find that balance or we're fighting against this like monster, you know, and we won't win. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And that's in my, at least what I've experienced through this healing process for myself. Yeah. That's been my experience as well. And I myself have not been in any sort of recovery or a treatment center or anything like that. But being somebody who hosts retreats and holds space at retreats, what I see is and I'm, I'm just wondering if there's a connection that you experienced as well being in these treatment programs is when you're in this retreat bubble, very often you're in a different location. You're not in your home environment. And I can see the most incredible things being born or realizations or aha moments, whatever it is happening at these retreats. And that's why I love retreats so much. It's just such a powerful catalyst for transformation. And many of, you know, it's been only women so far at my retreats and many of the women will go back into their home environments and will, you know, some will make really dramatic 
big transformational changes. The majority, I would say, fall somewhere in the middle. They might take some pieces with them. And then there are some people that the moment they get back to the whatever unhealthy environment that these thoughts or limiting beliefs were created in, it is so hard for the transformation to exist when you go back to that environment. Was that a part of your experience as well? Gosh, you just hit the nail on the head. Yeah, that's exactly what happens in recovery too. So if most of your trauma has happened in a house, if most of your trauma has happened with your significant other or with your mother and father or with a certain sibling, and you're going right back to it, your tools that you've learned in three months or in a weekend, they're not strong enough, right? They're not secure. Like, And we could even take that scientific with the brain. They're not set enough to go back to that environment and be able to just completely thrive. That's why they say in recovery, it's people, places, and things. Like you have to change those three mm. to support your recovery, right? And so it, to me, it's, it's a spectrum. Like, yes, people that struggle with addictions are really far on the side, right? But you're still suffering in an unhappy marriage or an unhappy relationship and you're going back to that. And part of the healing process is to make big decisions and big changes too, you know, what, and to support that lifestyle, to support that growth and that soul. So I can completely relate to what you're saying. It, it's the same thing, you know, the modality or the coping mechanism might be different, but it's the same thing, just going back to that environment that they say made you sick, right? But it doesn't have to be sick. It could just make you unhappy. It may, made you feel a certain way. What would you say, now I'm taking you all the way back, <laughs> what would okay. you say your experience was as a child. So did you know that you were always this really feeling open hearted kind of feeler child? Was that your experience right off the bat? No, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I thought something was wrong with me. I mm -hmm. always thought that that's that ego. That's that reoccurring thought in my head is that something was wrong with me because what everybody was telling me worked or pe and that that was just in the recovery world but even at home I remember being young and I could feel my family members and so when I would come home from school and my parents would come home from work and my siblings I'm one of four I'm the, one of the second middles I could know what type of a day my parents had had and I could know what type of a day my siblings had had and I had this ability in my head to, to transform into who I needed to be. So I could be really outgoing and funny. And that was, the, I thought that honestly was me until about five years ago, this really like extrovert type of a human. And I could be on and I would get the Whitney Houston record on and I would get up there and I would perform and I, I would just be the show. Or there were times where I could feel the tension was the tension in the rooms. Right. And I knew just to disappear, or I knew when to be funny and make jokes. And I could always tell what type of an evening it was going to be. But I thought everybody could do that. And so there was a time, honestly, I was in recovery, it was in my 20s. And I made a comment to my mom about how I could tell what type of mood dad was in when he got home at night. And she was like, what? Or I'd be like, what's wrong with dad right now? And she'd be like, nothing. What are you talking about? And I'm like, I can feel it but I didn't have the terminology. I didn't know. I just knew, you know? And so honestly, it was not until I read the first, you know, empath book that was handed to me probably four years ago. And then I started reading how to do the work by the holistic psychologist. And then I started reading some of these books and it was like, things were going off like, oh my gosh, this is me. Like for the first time in my life, I felt understood. Like I felt like I wasn't crazy. Like the, I don't know. And there were more of me out there and there was a language around this and a way to protect that energy and tools. And it took me being in my mid thirties to find any of that. Hmm. You just gave me 
a full body aha moment with sharing that exchange of your mom. I too, that has been my experience of life as well as just reading the room and reading people's energy. And so I've come to terms with that and and know how to take care of that at this point. And that's a part of why I've created this podcast to help other people not feel so alone in that. But what you just gave me the aha around was the way that you shared about your mom being like, what? What do you mean? Because that's the other part of the experience for me. And I just I hadn't seen it like that before. So not only if we're these really sensitive feeling children that may think everyone else operates this way, but they don't, when we know what they are feeling, yet they dismiss it and or don't acknowledge it or say it's the opposite, I think there was a part for me that struggled to trust what I was feeling was the truth because everyone would say, oh, yeah, no, it's not that I'm fine. I'm f whatever that is. And I could feel beyond the language because I don't know, I, this is new for this is just I'm processing this as we speak. I think it probably comes from a place of if they are so out of touch with their own feelings and emotions, then of course they don't even recognize. It's not even that they are lying to us. It's more they're lying to themselves because they can't recognize that. I don't know how, where right. is this landing? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And you think of it, we're on the brink now, right? Of identifying emotions and identifying emotions inside of ourselves and what they look like and giving them language. Like we're on this whole new brink of moving forward when it comes to mental health and communicating with one another about our needs and our feelings. Yes, we weren't taught that as children. And as a teacher, we still don't teach our kids that. But I've learned like with my daughter, she's, she is clone of me in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? And so I've noticed that she picks up when something's wrong with me and she'll be like, mom, are you okay? And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I can't lie to her, right? I can't. Because that's what happened to me. And what, when you're lied to, or when you're told something, you start to not trust the intuition, right? You start to not trust your gut. So as a five-year-old, you're in your body saying, oh, but this is what I'm feeling. But this adult that I'm supposed to trust is telling me different then obviously they're right. And I have to tune out this intuitional, the sound. And so that is really when children start to disconnect from that part of themselves, because as adults, we tell them differently. And that is what we're doing is we're now reconnecting to that part of us, right? 30 years later, we're now reconnecting to that voice that leads the way. We just lost it for a while. So with my daughter, I'm like, yeah, honey, I just got some, I just got some news. You, you felt my energy shift. I, it did. You're absolutely right. But most oh. children, we get scared out of that, you know, and so they disconnect, which is why I love what you're doing with breathwork because breathwork brings us back to our bodies, right? Because we learned so long ago how to disconnect from our bodies. And this journey we're, we're both on because we both said breath work was like such a massive piece for both of us that brings you back into your body. But in doing so, you now start to feel all of that unhealed, untapped trauma mm. has happened over the past, you know, 30 years. So, mm. yeah, I just want to acknowledge you breaking the cycle, which is so beautiful. and doing that with your daughter. What a gift. What a gift. And all of the trauma that you've experienced in your life to be able to offer her that validation. Because I think, at least from my experience, I've had to learn to trust myself again, even without validation, you know, without the external validation, without validation from the rest of the world and being able to feel that. And you're right, like the breath work for me, now that I'm holding space for classes, 
of groups of people, it is truly one of the greatest honors I've ever had in my life to be witness to a room full of brave and vulnerable people that whether they start crying to have some sort of release, I just keep being amazed at, okay, you're here, you're here, I've got you. And like the willingness to go into those places. Yeah. Hmm. Because most of us have been running from those places for so long. Mm -hmm. So to actually make the conscious choice to go to it and them choosing you to be there to witness and hold that space like that, that gives me goosebumps when you've done it because I've done my fair share of breathwork classes and it is always the most powerful thing to be a part of, not just the energy in the room, but to watch the vulnerability and the strength it takes to, to go there, to go there. Because let's be honest, Many people will go through their life and choose not to, you know, they will choose to avoid those parts and they will choose to, and they will come up with every excuse in the book to do so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's incredible to be a part of. I agree. Hmm. I want to give our listeners the hope, the roadmap, whatever little tidbit of both you and I have found ourselves like we now can identify what it is. First off, we can identify, oh, I'm feeling something in the body. So your first step might be just awareness that you're feeling something. You don't know what it is. And then getting to the place where you can identify maybe the location. Oh, OK, I'm I'm feeling something in my gut. I'm feeling something in my throat wherever that location is. And then to bring the language to it of hmm, what I'm feeling right now, it might start out to be sadness. And then as we peel back the layers, it's like, okay, what's under the sadness? Well, it's more like disappointment versus grief and giving that language. This is new for me. I was not born this way. I was I was born a very sensitive child and tried to find healthy and also very unhealthy ways of managing all of those feelings. And this is new. This is new for me finding this. So it's like the work of Brene Brown, who, of course, has inspired this podcast, Atlas of the Heart, that book, creating the language, just understanding the language even more. But it's a practice. It's a practice of choosing to be conscious, choosing to be aware every day. Do you have any tips or anything you want to share about this part of maybe somebody who's really disconnected, how we can start to come back to our bodies and our emotions? Yeah, I honestly did. I had a teacher probably two and a half years ago that, that taught me exact this. And she got out the emotion wheel, right? You can also use Brene's book. I mean, anything that gives you a wide variety of emotions and their meanings, because once again, emotions, we as, as children know five emotions, right? And so everything falls under those five emotions. Like we have no idea that there are so many others. So what I started to do was exactly what you said. I had three bullet points. So I would identify something's going on in my body. And sometimes just bringing consciousness to that, especially when you have been avoiding that feeling for so long, just being like, I feel something in my body right now. I feel an emotion. And for me, my indicator was that I would have the eating disorder would pop up. So I always knew something was going on because I was getting either an urge to restrict or an urge to binge or something. So the eating disorder would pop up and I'd be like, oh, that's my red flag. Something's going on. And so then I'd say, where is it in my body? Exactly. Like you said. And I sometimes would even put my hands on it. Right. I'd be like, OK, it's in my heart space. It's in my throat. It's in my, you know, it's in my jaw. It's where is it? And then I feel statements. I feel this. And then the second or the third, after that, I would bring my breath to it. So I would bring my breath to that spot in my nose, out my mouth. And usually, 
95% of the time, I would either have some sort of an emotional response, what might be tears. There was a lot of pain underneath a lot of this. So it might be tears, it might be anger, it might be that, but I would have some sort of rem- a, an emotional response or the feeling would let go. The feeling would process, it would pass, it would go through its cycle. So those were my bullet points for a long time until that I consciously could be like, I'm feeling it. I'm letting it come up. I'm processing it. I'm setting a boundary. I'm doing whatever I need to do where the process got faster. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, it didn't at all. It felt like I was learning how to ride a bike. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for that example. We can easily put that into practice. And for me, I think the next level of this for me has become, which Brene talks about is harder. Once we can start to identify emotions, it's the next level that is more challenging is to identify emotions in the moment. And Mm -hmm. for me, with my family of origin, like the family I grew up with, that is my hardest place to do it, to recognize in the moment what I'm feeling. But in other areas of my life, it's becoming easier for me. And the more I practice it, the more I can now start to take it into the harder conversations of like, ooh, why didn't that land right? What am I feeling underneath this? Has that been your experience as well? Yes. I still struggle in two areas. And it's around my family at times. I love them to death. I Mm -hmm. feel like I need to say that. But I still go back to old Tracy when I'm in yeah. in that environment. And it's very hard. I went through about a year where I just kind of sat back because I'm like, I don't know who to be right now. Mm-hmm. I'm not the old one. I'm not really sure what the new one looks like yet. Kind of in this middle. I don't know how to handle this, right? So in that situation, and then in old relationships, honestly, that was always an area for me too, that finding my voice was very difficult. And so when dealing with certain people or certain things, like the environments that, like we said, people, places, and things, right, where it triggers that old response, those old feelings, those old emotions it's hard for me to show up as Tracy today, right? I still Mm -hmm. get triggered. When I get triggered, I shut down. I shut down. I lose any sort of ability to come up with verbiage to describe what I'm feeling or what I need. And I protect myself, you know? Yep. So, yes, Hmm. that is still a constant effort for me in those situations to be like, okay, Okay, we can do this. We can can do this. Mm. Yeah. Mm. What would you say, what is the cost of not feeling the feelings? Mm. I would never go back, to be honest with you. I wouldn't. There are days where I'm like really emotional. I'm like, oh, I miss those days. (laughs) I wasn't like, yep. What is the cost? The cost is, you know, I told you that story the last time we met about that day when the I was riding in the car and the, it was a spring day here in Syracuse and the music was on and the windows were down and it was on some back country roads and I got this rush and I'm used to eating disorder rushes. I'm used to highs with relationships. I'm used to that feeling that you chase, right? I got this rush that I'd never experienced before. And it was a natural high. Like it was a, it was a natural feeling of being alive. And I was like, I have been missing out on this for so many years. And it, I will never forget that day because I felt alive. And at that point, every emotion, every tear, every pillow that I threw, every, it was worth it. It was worth it because I'm like, this, this is what it means to be alive. And yes, does it mean that there are days, I I cry every day, let's be honest. I cry every single day. 
but I've learned that about myself. I'm an emotional human being and I'm normalizing emotion around my children, right? I cry mm-hmm. when I see something sad, I, you know, but to be in a society that still normalizes the speed that we do things and the amount that we're available and the amount we put out and it's very different because it's it's very hard because it's it's two different lives. Let's be honest, it's two different lifestyles. So I I totally forgot what your question was. <laughs> no, that was a beautiful. You gave us the why. You gave us the why we do this work. The why, which yeah. is so you can be standing in front of a gorgeous waterfall and feel it and take in the awe and wonder and the beauty and allow that in. And because when we numb the pain, we numb the joy. Yes, we do. Mm. So Mm. I guess that's my, my why everything is just brighter. Everything is brighter and things are temporary. Like the fear is not there anymore. I used to wake up every day in fear. And Mm -hmm. it's not there. I I just, I choose to not see fear. I choose to trust. I choose to see love instead, which sounds cliche and cheesy, but, but I do. And so Mm. I just, I wouldn't have it any other way. No. Yeah. I'm so glad for you and for us and for all, all the people that you're helping find their way home, their way back to remembering that. Yeah. And it's wild because, I mean, the average emotion lasts less than 90 seconds. And right. we work so freaking hard to avoid feeling that whatever uncomfortable feeling it is. But it's like, no, just allow it for 90 seconds and then it'll pass. Right? Then it's gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's great. We avoid, we avoid, we numb, we, we run. And then all of a sudden, I remember the first time I went through that process, I let it come up and I cried and then it was done. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is really, this was that bad. Like, like, (laughs) I was running for five days from that, five days from that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yep. 90 seconds. That's it. (laughs) 90 seconds. Uh, Will you share with us what it is you have going on at Safe Space Organization, what's already happening there, and take us on the dream. Take us where where we're going with this. All right. So the dream. Currently, we are running a series of support groups. So we, the Safe Space is happening on the third floor of the Strathmore Pink Building, which is on the west side, like the bottom of Tip Hill in Syracuse. And so we are currently under construction because we are raising money to have the space done. We did not bite off an easy task here. Not only is this a movement against mental health and the way we approach mental health, but it's also a massive space. And for a startup non-for-profit, people are looking at us like, eh, where's your data? Prove that this works, right? And so That is what we've been trying to do for the past two or three years is prove that this works. So we have a series of support groups and a lot of them are peer to peer run with a facilitator because what I found was that when you put a bunch of people in the same room that have experienced grief and loss, divorce, you know, men's health, you name it, they have these brilliant ideas all on their own. And this, the magic of what happens of empowering peers and trusting and it's just magic. And so a lot of them are peer to peer run. And then the rest, the provider services, we're currently pushing out to providers. So once the space is complete, you will walk in the door and it'll be a large communal space. We'll have comfy couches and chairs and all of that, but there'll be a large eat-in area with a kitchen space because We'll have nutritionists come in and be able to run their demos through there. But a lot of the eating disorder work that I'm starting to do will start to run support groups and supportive meals through there. And then there's five office spaces that'll be used for individual breath work and massage and Reiki and 
one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions. And then there's four rooms. So there's two support group rooms. And then one's an art therapy room and one is a movement and dance and yoga room. So as a member, as a safe space member, you'll be able to go in there and use the space. But the goal is to build your own toolbox. So my toolbox does not look like your toolbox and will not look like Sam's toolbox, right? But the only reason I had access to these services is because I went to treatment. I probably wouldn't have tried art therapy as a 14 year old if I hadn't been in treatment, you know? So we need to start normalizing these things that creativity is a huge part of recovery. And a huge part of the healing, that soul release, right? Like finding your creative outlet. And so people can dip their toe into these classes, into these modalities and see if it works. And if it does, then awesome. Go sign up with that provider in their space and like rock it. That's why we have the people here. We have the providers. We just need a way to all kind of come together. So that is the hope for safe space. Mm, I love that. That's my intention with doing interviews with you and other people like you is there are a hundred, a thousand, a million different paths to your own healing. There's so many different ways. And I love that you're creating a space that says, okay, it doesn't just have to be talk therapy because I love talk therapy. I have a therapist who I go, who I get so much Thanks. value out of, but I also have to do other things. It's not just, that's not my only path that I take. And so I love this idea of, I can just see the visual of people creating their toolbox in your environment because you're going to expose them to so many different things. And one might work now and then six months, two years from now, they might need a different modality. And I love that this is going to become a space where that is possible. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So powerful. Thank you. Yeah. That is the hope. That is. Yeah. You're on your way there. Do you want to share how much money we need to manifest in order to bring us to the goal of this building. I know this is a very big building that has needed a lot of work. It is because it's a very old building, but oh God, it's so beautiful. And what's amazing is that the building as a whole is a safe space. So when I was approached by the owners of the building, they were like, you're what we're looking for because they have a space on the second floor that deals mostly with brain health and brain research and teaching educators in our community how to teach their students about brain health. And then we have a co-working space. We have a fresh fruit and vegetable market. We are creating this whole person, right? This whole way of dealing, healing a person, right? It's not just about the mental health, it's the physical health, it's the nutrition, right? It's who you surround yourself with. It's all of these things. So I knew this was going to be something we, ha we had to work towards because there are other spaces that we could have gone for probably, that, but this, this envisioned what safe space was. This, this just broadened what we were. And so we need $300,000 to finish the build out of the space. Mm -hmm that we have started taking on through donations and grants. We're actually going to roll out a large donation plan in the next month or so to allow businesses and community members in the area to really be a part of the foundation of safe space. And then we're having this beautiful mural done by one of our local artists here that will incorporate all of them into this sort of community coming together, which will be the main wall of safe space. Mm -hmm. So we've had to get creative with this idea because a lot of people have said, show me, show me what this looks like. Right. And we're like, well, we can't really show you because <laughs> we got to go space. We got to finish the space. But I have an incredible board behind me of go-getters that believe in this mission so much. And 
we're getting there. Hmm. I love that. I love people who are willing to dream really big. This is yeah. one of, I think it was Henry Ford had said, yeah, it was uh, one of his quotes that said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. And so instead we got cars because we had somebody who was willing to dream really big and outside the box and to fit a need that people didn't really know and understand that they have. Because like you said, our traditional model is medicine and talk therapy. And there's so many mm -hmm. other ways that we can help continue to move, move this energy through our bodies. So I imagine you'll yeah. be even doing things like yoga and physical, some things physically moving it through the body in this space as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big part in normalizing that physical doesn't mean three hours at the gym every day, right? Physical can come in so many forms. Mm -hmm. And really, once you start to tune into your body more, you start to learn the language of your body and know when you've hit your max, you know? And I was, I was an excessive exerciser during my athlete and college days. And to do that, there's actually a disconnect that happens. To be able to put your body through that type of work, you tend to disconnect, right? And so we're asking people to do the very opposite. And so a lot of those modalities, like yoga and other ways of just using your body, like uh, what was the other? Like Qigong or Tai Chi or... Yes. Yeah, so more, yeah. more Tai Chi, but also like a boxing class, like ways that like really mm. learning using your own body mass in a lot of ways yeah. or lightweight lifting, like some of those, because we're on the third floor, we can't necessarily do some anything too hardcore, but... <laughs> <laughs> moving yeah. the body is part of the plan hmm. okay well are you ready for some rapid fire questions oh gosh yeah I actually brought my book like I got okay good. Because... good 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 <laughs> it's funny some people I don't give the rapid fire to some people I do some people I think you I just gave it to like yesterday so last minute but for me, books have changed my life. And that is probably the biggest thing that I do on a daily basis of how am I nourishing myself. So I like to start there. So what's your favorite book? Oh, God, that is hard. <laughs> okay, so my favorite books are probably around the time period that I discovered this soul side of myself, right? So like Untamed by Glennon, Daring Greatly by Brene, The Body Keeps the Score, Hard Read, but mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the other one? Seed of the Soul. Seed of the Soul was another yes. one that was a big one for me. So those I all read within like a, a year time frame. And so those are top four right there. Mm, I love all of those. And I don't know if anyone brought that up. Seed of the Soul. Gary Zukoff, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll add him to the list. What are you currently reading? Oh my gosh, it's so funny. I, <laughs> so I read three books at one time, okay? Yep. Because I have like three parts of me. So I'm currently reading It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover because it's like the dirty like fantasy thing. Yeah, totally into that. I have to read that before bed. I can't read that before, like I can't read anything. <laughs> yeah. So I'm doing The War of Art, which I had never read The War of Art. Love that book. Stephen Pressfield, writing... right? Yes. Is it Stephen Pressfield? Yep. Me? Okay. I don't mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then Braiding Sweetgrass is another yep. one that was recently recommended. So those are mm. those are my three current. Mm. Yes. Yes. I love anyone experiencing any resistance in their life needs to read that Stephen Pressfield, The War of Art. Absolutely. And yeah. braiding sweetgrass, I'm in as well. And it's one of mine where I'm, I just read a couple pages a day. So same, mm -hmm. same. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm, okay. What's one thing you know for sure? One thing I know for sure. If I continue to choose love over fear every single day, then my soul is aligned with where it's supposed to go. Like that is a decision I make every single day. And I know that for sure. Hmm. I'm taking pretty deep. Sorry. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I'm taking that one in. That one's beautiful. And do you have a favorite quote or poem, something you want to leave us with? Yeah. So um, I actually just pulled it off the wall because it's right by my bed every night. So it's by the Dalai Lama. It says, there are only two days in the year that nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called tomorrow. So today is the right day to love, believe, do, and mostly live. Mm. So beautiful. Mm. Thank you. Oh, Thank so you. I'm going to put these all in the show notes. Of course, I've got the website is safespacecny.com. We've got a couple different Instagrams at safespacecny and at ED recovery tidbits. We'll put that in there. Is there anywhere else you want people to be able to connect with you? No, oh, I think that's good. Mm. I think that's good. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your journey with us and sharing some hope and inspiration of how we can all continue to heal and take care of ourselves and whether you can experience safe space in our community or you may live somewhere else in the country just know that there are tools and things and places and people that are all out there just ready to help you on your journey Mm, thank you so much thanks Meg I appreciate it I'm so grateful you're here thank you for listening and if you loved this episode will you please share it with a friend or two be sure to rate review and follow the show on Spotify Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts so you're sure to never miss a single episode This podcast is part of the Sound Advice FM network. Sound Advice FM, women's voices amplified.